The natural world is a system of concentric circles, and we, now and then, detect in nature slight dislocations, which apprise us that this surface on which we now stand is not fixed, but sliding. From the essay, Circles, by American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. The more that we actually learn about the world we're in, the greater, not the less, the greater the mysteries. We're like in a circle, and everything that you know is inside that circle, and then the boundary of the circle is the boundary of the unknown. And the more you learn, the larger that circle gets. And guess what? So too, the larger the boundary of the unknown. The more you learn, the more conscious you are, the greater the mysteries become. The more you actually are aware of not knowing. Civilizations elsewhere, burgeoning on planets that are young, perhaps, that have been around for just a few billion years, like the Earth. The Earth is actually quite young, in a sense. Been here 4.6 billion years, but the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Nine billion years happened before the Earth was even formed and before the Sun was even made. We see a sliding window of planetary formation. Planets that are just forming now, planets in maturity like our Earth, and planets that have survived the death of their star. That tells everyone that this has been going on for billions of years and continues to go on. So I expect that there's going to be civilizations at all levels out there. I know our science is not nearly the science of, say, an extraterrestrial civilization that's been here for 9 billion years. It won't be. But our science has made some progress, and we can see residual effects within our, our scientific purview of another advanced science that's affecting it. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for something that's kind of adding this, this noise into our universe that we can detect. And that's where all this happens. This is where all this comes from. There's definitely enough corroborative information out there to justify more research into this story. There was a Harvard study not too long ago uh, that made a lot of news where they said, you know, sleep paralysis was the answer for this phenomenon. What's interesting, I felt, was the amount of attention that story got. And it got a lot, which indicates there are a lot of people interested in the mechanisms of this phenomenon, why this happens. You know, we acknowledge the UFO problem as, as a real phenomenon. There's something going on. So we have to ask ourselves, who's behind it? Is it the Russians? No. Is it the American secret societies? Not entirely. There's a component of otherness to this. And when you get story after story of these abductions, I don't think it's that impossible to believe, to be honest with you. We often demonize experts because they, they aren't kind of going where we want them to go, or that can happen, and I think that's dangerous. It pushes them away, and it makes it us versus them, and there's certainly room where we can all kind of go together, because it's not important whether there's something happening at the quantum level, or whether DNA is being manipulated. What's important is that the issue is addressed seriously and that we all walk down the road of trying to discover what's going on together. Really hope to inspire the next generation to be curious, to want to explore, but mostly to look for the answers for themselves, to not always just accept what they're told, you know, to get out there and put boots on the ground and explore life and ask the big questions and then go after the answers. When you open yourself to more, you always get more. If you close yourself off to this creed and doctrine and this is the way it is and I gotta do this, then no, you're not gonna grow. There is so much more to know than we know. I don't care who you are and I wanna know everything. I don't care what it was. If if I think that aliens are, are one thing and they turn out to be totally different than that, that's fine. I just wanna know the truth, no matter what it takes. I would say millions of people around the world. The Roper Poll did a couple of surveys several years ago, and they came out with one in 50 American adults, that's just the United States, that had experiences that could point to abduction. You know, we're just talking one in 50 in the United States. A tremendous number of people in the world, not only in the United States, who are having these visits from extraterrestrial beings. I've also concluded that there are many different types of extraterrestrial beings, 
who are coming here to Earth and interacting with certain human beings. It's a strange kind of scenario, right? But there's been a number of these that have come out through uh, researchers who have been dedicated to kind of unpacking this. So I think that there's something happening here. Some of these cases are believable, as incredible as they seem. The individuals, I guess I would say, seem believable. You know, when you hear these stories from the most credible people that aren't asking for anything, they just want to tell you. In today's world, it's extremely brave for someone to make their story public in this arena. Obviously, this is this has caused an issue in their life. And this taboo means that there's a lot of people going untreated for something that's affecting their well-being. And that's just wrong because of this ridiculous kind of irrational taboo we have around the thought of aliens. film is not for everyone. If you believe abduction stories are hoaxes and those telling them are liars, it's definitely not for you. But if you're open to the idea that we're not alone in the universe, that alien hybridization programs are indeed a possibility, that people just like you are used for reproductive experiments against their will, then you'll be intrigued by what April, Rob, Geraldine, and several other experiencers have to share. These are their stories. Listen intently and try to imagine how you might react if you were in their shoes. This is back in, you know, the 90s. I can remember waking up at like 3 a.m. going outside of my bed into a field across from the countryside with that and to start looking up at the sky. And a piece of me was wondering, where is that light? Where did that thing go? Spent many nights, you know, wondering, what did I see? What was that? I remember my mom was compelled to talk about it, urged me, you know, you wanna draw a picture of it? Do you wanna draw colors of it? The disc shape with all the different orange, green, red, and draw them really brightly and Sometimes I draw like 
like a light shining down onto the house. My family and I are watching fireworks with my wife, and I see a little satellite, you know, up in the sky like that. I remember just telling everybody, hey guys, look, a satellite. Oh yeah, yeah fireworks. Yeah. Well, so nothing, I think, I think nothing of it. Later that night, about two o'clock in the morning, I see the satellite again, you know, but it's coming out from a different angle. Next thing I know, that satellite is just over the neighbor's house, a typical glowing uh, disc-shaped object. And as we're walking, right like this, the ship is also going with us, right? And then we'd stop, it would stop. We'd look away and the ship would light up and we'd look at it and it'd turn off. And for about like 10 minutes, it was doing that with us. And then next thing it's just, boom, it's gone. It's, it's the satellite again. And at that moment, I was like, it's, this shit's real. Three years ago, I wouldn't even imagine that I would be doing what I'm doing today. Not even a little bit. When I was abducted in 2013, I didn't want to tell anyone about that. There was no way I would tell my extended family about it. And I had to think 10 times before telling my family about it. Three months after my abduction, I met my partner that I was with at that time. I was busy with my career and he wanted to have a family. The more I started to have other experiences too of, of abduction, I couldn't talk to him about it. And then when we moved in together, just at nighttime, things that would happen to me, and he, he couldn't handle it. I started um, having the strange experiences in childhood. Being part of adolescence, I was pretty much engaged in what that brings into one's life. I had an experience at four, an experience at like 14 and a half, and 17, 18, 19. And when I was 27, I started to have sightings in broad daylight with neighbors, witnesses, coworkers, family, friends, colleagues. The memories of um, being taken on the ship, being on a table, and then having them distract me with some kind of other memory or, or some kind of screen image. And so that's what I remember from the hypnosis sessions. And they did it time after time after time. When I was seven, my mom had a nervous breakdown. That's what they called it back then. Manic depression, call it what you will, but there was something always about it that was not biochemical, and I knew that. Her mom had an issue, her grandmother had an issue. It seemed to be cyclic. I wish I could say I knew what triggered it. I have suspicions. But it never left me that there were aspects of her mania that um, hand out to be true, things that she said that she knew that were true. As a kid, I'm sure it had a major effect on me, but at the same time, I was still very much wanting to go outside and play and do the things that normal kids do. I was up late, everybody else had gone to bed, and I was sitting in a, in a lazy boy chair, and I noticed to my right peeking around the corner at me from the dining room into the living room was what you would see as a typical gray alien like you would see on TV or something. It was peeking around the corner at me and the way he did his neck was so strange. The way he held his head and bent his neck. I was petrified. I normally would pray, you know, with something. I couldn't even, I couldn't even think. I couldn't. It was just my brain did not know where to put that. Even when I went to first go tell my husband what I had seen that very first time, I didn't have proof of that. But I knew, I knew what I had seen. I know what's happened to me, but I can't prove any of it. I went in my room to go to bed. I was an office manager at the time. I had a project due the next day. I sat my alarm next to me, sat on my bed, and I thought, if I fall asleep right now, I'm gonna get six and a half hours of sleep. I did a quick little, like close my eyes meditation process sitting on my bed. Just a real quick like visualization process, calm myself down, deep breathing so I could get to sleep right away. I turned to turn off the light. I looked back at the clock. I just sat the alarm because I want to make sure I didn't forget to set it. It was absolutely sat. I go to turn off the light. I look back at the clock, just again, double checking the alarm. It was like two and a half to three hours later. And I was like, okay, what just happened? And I couldn't get an image out of my head of three gray aliens standing next to the bed. I was living in Manitou Springs and I was dating a woman named Gina. 
We had a two bedroom apartment, um, ground floor apartment. It was late, we'd gone to bed, and I heard this blood curdling scream. And I woke up and I rolled over and I looked at the clock and it said 12.36 a.m. And then my girlfriend got up out of the bed, didn't say anything, walked into the bathroom, didn't turn the light on, shut the door, and I heard the toilet seat cover come up and I heard her sit down and I was facing the bathroom door and I thought, that's odd. And then I felt really pulled back into, like really pulled back into sleep quickly. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and everything in me was an alarm, like danger, danger, danger. And I opened my eyes and standing against the wall next to the bathroom door was this little gray creature and it scared me really badly. I had a lot of adrenaline go through my body and I tried to move and I couldn't move. And I struggled against that and I tried to fight it. I tried to fight it um, mentally. I tried to fight it physically. And I would get to the point where I would literally panic and pass out again. This went on for some time. I would say 20 or 30 times of me waking up, not being able to move, panicking and passing out again. Each time I would do this, this gray being kept getting closer to the bed. And as I was getting a hold of myself, this time I came awake, I opened my eyes and I looked right at it and I heard clearly this time, be still, we aren't here to hurt you. We are only here to check on you. As that was happening, I started to have these flashbacks a flash of being on a gurney being moved down a hallway, a flash of being in a bright lit room, a flash of them being over me, leaning over my stomach, and then it made me panic and pass out again. And then when I woke up again, this being was really close to the bed, really, really close. And when I opened my eyes, I said, why are you doing this to me? And he just said, be still, almost like this programmed response at some point, this horrific experience ended where all at the same time, my girlfriend throws open the, the door, turns on the light, is cursing about her legs being asleep, is trying to walk, trying to stand. And I looked over at the clock and it was like four hours later. Never left my room, right? I'm sitting there on my bed, calm myself down, turn off the light, go to sleep. I go to work the next day, come home, dead tired. My roommate approaches me in the kitchen, I'm making dinner that night and says, what happened to you last night? After our discussion, she couldn't sleep. She thought she heard a prowler downstairs. We had a two-story townhouse. She went downstairs, nobody there. There was a gap under my bedroom door, so she could clearly see that my light was on. So she knocks on my door. She says, like, three in the morning. She knocks on my door. No answer. She pounds on my door. No answer. Now she's afraid that something has happened to me. So she goes in my room. I'm not there. She witnessed I was gone during my missing time. She goes back, sits on her bed. She sees a flash of light in the hallway. She looks expecting to see me. She sees a three and a half foot tall, or you know, four, four foot gray alien, steps in the door of her room. She's fully conscious, sitting in bed. It stares right at her. She closed the door to my room. It goes through my closed doors if nothing's there. So she's telling me that. And she goes, she had read Whitley Streeper's communion prior to that, because this is like early 90. And she said, you know that book by that guy, that famous author, I, I, do you think you might be having that go on? And I said, I don't know. What's most intriguing about April, Rob, and Geraldine is the divergent journeys they've taken following their abduction experiences. April's innocence and genuine wonder still abound, despite what her nightmares were hiding. Rob's search for answers continue while he grapples with the obvious question, why me? And Geraldine's experiences, as shocking as they are, have encouraged her to be a conduit for awareness. Well, out of the blue, I have, a, I have this very vivid dream. And this is one of the dreams that it was so powerful that I woke up and I had to write everything down in my dream. Not only did I have to write things down, I had to go to the bathroom and physically look at my body. And I remember after I went to the bathroom, looked at my body, I made very specific notes. And then the amazing thing is the next morning after this dream, very vivid, vivid dream, I told my husband all about the dream. And I said, look at my stomach. I looked at my stomach and there's evidence of something here. There's evidence on my sheet that I slept in of a little tiny blood mark. And my husband, he looked at me immediately, he said, April, Something else is going on here. 
These are not nightmares. 2009, I was 28 years old, uh, prime of my life, and my stomach started hurting really bad, right? Started getting really bad stomach cramps. Uh, I couldn't keep food in me. It's like, I wouldn't be throwing it up, but it's, you know, in, out. I went from 210 pounds to 115 pounds. I was given a pretty much a, a not a good diagnosis. The doctor said that I was going to end up dying and that I needed to have a feeding tube put in me. And they couldn't determine what what it was. They just knew that I was going to die from from this uh, from this illness. A ton of research and a string of encounters that made me go like, oh no, you know. Uh, Best way to describe it is a pit dropping down into my stomach. Oh no, I might be interacting or involved with this phenomenon. I went to bed, everything was normal, and exactly at 3.33 on the dot, I wake up and there's such a bright light and it just annoys me because the first thing I think, who is that inconsiderate person shining this light? I go to my window and I'm looking through my blinds and I see the light even brighter. I mean, so bright that my eyes hurt, you know, I'm squinting and I'm trying to look behind and I'm like, that can't be a car, what is that? And I see metallic and I see the ship. And then I'm looking to this side, light, and the ship. And as I'm approaching this, my body just paralyzed, completely paralyzed. And on the other side, there are these six tall shadows that I'm seeing from this light emerging. And I'm seeing them walk towards me, this uh, gray. It was a gray with these gigantic eyes. And I'm seeing the other five in front of me, the six is over here and I'm getting pulled inside the ship and I'm walking in with the being next to me, waves his hand and everything around me changes. When I have an experience, I say I'm coming into the awareness of the experience, right? So when I become aware that I'm having an experience, uh, it's like, poof, you know, you go to bed and then uh, something's happening to me. Like, this, you would say, think dream, but it's not a dream because you have your five senses, you know, you can touch, you can, you can uh, taste, you can smell and, you know, hear and there's textures, you know, you can see the textures. Where in the dream, you know, there's not so much texture uh, in the dream. So it'd be stuff like I'm standing in my pajamas, you know, by the, like that I've gone to bed and I'm in the pajamas I go to bed in, and I'm like in this metal dome and there would be like a, a, a platform on the ground and this weird graded floor, but there'd be all these little little tiny gray beings surrounding me, you know, and they're all looking up at me like. How I now see abduction is that it's realer than real life. And it's almost as if a veil, a very delicate veil is completely ripped open and you can't close it back up again. Our life is an apprenticeship to the truth. Not around every circle, another can be drawn. There is no end in nature. But every end is a beginning. As unreal as alien hybridization programs sound, hundreds of thousands of people around the world have reported extraordinary experiences, allowing researchers to identify a likely sequence of events. The abductee witnesses a UFO, is taken aboard a craft and undergoes physical and neurological procedures. Ova, or sperm, is extracted following another abduction. Alien genetics are introduced in vitro or through sexual contact with an extraterrestrial being. Following another abduction, an embryo is implanted. After carrying for up to four months, the woman is abducted again and the fetus removed. A woman or man is abducted and shown their hybrid children. Memories are implanted, so the abductee doesn't recall the event. One of the hardest things for me to wrap my head around was getting into the field of not only abductions, but a breeding program that involved extraterrestrials. And yet there's case after case 
that has probative evidence to support the witnesses' accounts, you can't ignore this anymore. Some people have been taken, men and women have been taken, and some of them have been used for purposes of reproduction, and it appears hybridization. Blending with another species is something that you would do if you want to fit in and not be noticed. Why would you do that? If you were a conqueror, you would just come and say, get out of the way, and you'd crush them, and then take over. But if you want to blend in, it means one of two things. It means either you're not strong enough to overpower and take them, or you're desperate because something's wrong with your world. And so you're trying to just find a new foothold, a new purchase, you know, a new island, a new Easter island for your species. And I think, I think that could be some of what's involved. Very well could be, but I would probably tend to think they're more here to upstep us and bring us into uh, another era. I don't know that that is happening personally. Um, however, I do think it's important for people to know that there are many, many people who do believe this is occurring to them. And for that reason, it does deserve to be taken seriously. I think it's, a, it's one of those irrational blind spots that we have in society right now. I just can't imagine not wanting you know, to do something, and yet they're laying on a table and these odd machines are around them. You know, just I think the fear or, you know, just what's next and um, just their lack of free will to get off the table and say, no, I, I don't want to do this and that be okay. From one side of our house, we could see a bright light. We were very drawn to it. And if you go to the next door room, which is the living room, the light wasn't there. So being curious nature in that, of course I was, I would go back to the other room and say, oh my goodness, look at these lights. Look, mom. So my mom would come and see it. She saw it and my sister saw it and we were all just, we were mesmerized. These lights were going different colors. They were going, speeding faster and faster. Soon before we knew it, it was boom, right in front of our eyes. My very first abduction was in Fremont when I was a child, five years old, living in an apartment just off Fremont Boulevard. I always used to go into my mother's bedroom, which was facing the pool. One day, I went in the evening time. My mother wasn't home, but my father was distracted, and I just went in there by myself. And as I'm looking outside the window, I'm seeing a, a light. So when we went into the regression, I'm seeing the light, and next thing I know, I'm five years old, walking up inside of a ship. And as I'm walking up inside of a ship, they're making me sit on a dental chair, and I'm laying back, and they are inserting inside of me, in my uterus, in the very back wall, an implant to monitor the body. My wife and I were staying, you know, in the, in the motorhome here, and I hear on the, I hear on the back, the back garage to get into the garage, uh, something jiggling the, the door handle, right? And uh, I'm like, oh shit, no man, you, gotta, you guys, because at this time I'm starting to realize that I'm being, I'm being taken, so I'm staying up uh, to avoid being abducted, you know, and uh, just this intense fear, and this, all of a sudden I hear something coming into the garage, and I'm like, oh shit, they're coming into the, Freaking garage, man! Because you know everyone's sleeping, right? It could it couldn't be anything else, and you can hear the little footsteps going through the in the out in the garage, tinkering around and <laughs> shit inside the garage. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to sleep, but I am going to sleep because there's something making me go to sleep, right? So I'm blacking out. There's all the children in one room, and I'm a, I'm a child being brought into this room, and I'm seeing all these children everywhere, and I'm, I'm, I'm being regressed as a child walking into this. Okay, what's happening here? I'm one of these children that's going to be inserted. The children seem happy, and they're playing, and they're enjoying themselves. And then when I look to my right, I'm seeing this gigantic glass wall and this mechanical arm moving things around from one side to the other. Now, in the regression, 
I'm being told, okay, well, look around and sense what's occurring. And what I'm looking through the glass is that they are grabbing the children and inserting through the rectum the, the implants, just like that with the machine. And yes, they are bleeding and they put the children piled up, unconscious, in another corner. And this is happening one glass wall away. Further in the ship, you go to the other side, and that's where they extract the babies as well from the women. And I'm seeing the, the women that are being put uh, inside of these hooks that open their legs up, and the children are being, they somehow, they do something to induce the, the, the labor. It's premature labor because they always want the children fetuses. They drop through this little cone. It's like a, like a slide almost and it slides down through this little hole where it's dropped into these cases, just like we were talking earlier, those cases. The next room, I'm seeing the tall greys um, with the petri dish doing the DNA alterations, injecting the fetuses. The entire operation, I guess it was a harvesting and hybridization ship particular to this process. Barbara Lamb has regressed hundreds of people. She hears common themes about the introduction of alien genetics. That material taken from her is mixed together with human sperm and mixed with the genetic material, the reproductive material of the extraterrestrials. So a new little embryo is created by them. The next regression goes to when I'm about 15, 16 years old. As I'm walking onto this ship, everything is black all around me and I see a, a, a chair, another chair in front of me that looks like, a, you know, like a gynecologist chair, examination chair, basically. So I'm being made to sit on there and they are inserting this gigantic uh, tube inside of my body and uh, they, they began the insemination process. So the liquid that they're putting within you is freezing. And I just remember that if you could just visualize, I guess, putting an ice cube inside of your body, you know, and just, I mean, it's just horrible. When I was regressed, what, what I remember is the pain. The pain, you, you, you tap into the pain sensation of, of what happened physically, right? Because your body's releasing information, basically. Now, another way that uh, humans are experiencing the reproductive program is to actually have a sexual relationship, a sexual contact with one of the extraterrestrial beings. So I have regressed certain women who've had uh, sexual intercourse with male extraterrestrials, particularly with the reptilian species. I know of at least five times I was abducted for reproduction. They took me out of an environment, basically. I was at a party and um, I met this beautiful looking man and um, I don't know what happened but I think he I think he basically drugged me of something and in the regression I'm saying that he is numbing me the only thing I remember in waking time is seeing his face and his eyes because I remember meeting this person but I don't remember being with him in the way that the regression brought it up. What I'm opening my eyes to is seeing his face directly in front of me and he is uh, inside of me. And I am uh, seeing his very cold, expressionless face directly in front of me. He gets up and he walks out and I can feel that I had been inseminated. Light skin, blue eyes, dark brown hair, very, very tall, very tall, uh, like basketball player tall, and uh, s slender, you know, uh, perfect, perfect body, very, very perfect body. 
handsome, handsome man, basically. But the second part is that I'm, I'm now looking who this man is. And apparently it's a screen image of the reptilians that were working there in that time. And it's actually not a real man. It's just a, a screen image illusion. So basically what that means is that for some women or men, when they are gathering eggs or trying to inseminate, they create these images, these screen images or experiences like holographic realities to make it look like you're experiencing something but you're not. Something that they would pull from my subconscious mind that would look like an ideal image of what a beautiful man or attractive man would be to me. I'm in and out of consciousness while this is happening, but I can see clearly him getting up out of the bed, not, not looking back, not talking, nothing. He's just leaving the room, marching out of the room, like, like a zombie, basically, like a robot. And I am sitting there um, on the bed, and um, I, remember, I remember feeling cold again, that cold sensation. And then the woman is taken another time, and that little embryo already formed as a mixture, a hybridized mixture, um, is implanted in the womb of the woman. And she will gestate that little embryo for a while, usually a month and a half or two months, or maybe a bit more. And one time I had a look like a burn a triangle burn next to my belly button. With a very long needle through the belly button, would probe around in the abdominal area until they found the uterus. Then they would go into the uterus and they would find the fetus with that instrument. And they would have some little thing that could capture it and, and pull it back out. They have this prong, like a three, uh, three, I believe it was a three finger prong. And they bring it inside of the body. It holds onto the fetus and pulls out. It just happens quick, it's so fast. That's another thing that's really incredible. They pull it out, they clip it, they hook it up, and they put it in, just like that. The hybridization program Rob was exposed to was slightly different. He was not subjected to reproductive experiments. I don't remember exactly the day. I just, the, the experience itself had a, had a uh, dramatic impact on me. And I remember just coming into an experience, right? Coming aware that I'm having an experience, you know, textures and everything. And I was in like this underground facility, the same kind of like grating almost on the ground in, in some dirt and, uh, but like lights going down like a, you know, stereotypical rock underground facility, right? I'm walking with this being down the hallway and there's other beings walking uh, just kind of looks like him, but not quite uh, going this way. Something felt wrong right here, right in my gut. Just, just a tightness, like something's off here. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And when a being would walk by me like this, it would kind of like look at me, you know? And like if walking by, it would just like, you know, but with this look like of malice, right? I felt malice from it. What I was looking at was a technology, an overlay of a human on top of, of it. So the image that they're projecting is of these tall white Nordic beings, right? But when I walked by, it was like a digital distortion in the holographic image, and I can see that there was a lizard face behind that holographic image. They were wearing the face that you, they wanted you to see. But they want everyone to see, not just me. This is their look. So they take me to the next room, and it's as far as I can see down there, like this hallway, and there's rows upon rows of these glass tube-like things uh, with this blue liquid inside and beings inside of these tubes that look like a tall white Zeta, right? With basically all these beings. And they said, oh, here's our cloning chambers. It's like cloning chambers. Oh, I don't like that either. That's not cool. I've had an experience where uh, I woke up and I was inside of the tube, right? And I look down, you know, and I'm in this blue liquid and I'm going, wait, and I see my hands, right? And my hands are these long fingers, white skin. And I'm like, 
is this me? And I'm all, oh shit, this is me. I'm wiggling my fingers. Oh shit, this is me. And I look out and there's all these beings like going, oh shit, you know, they're like scrambling around, you know, and uh, blackout. So there's something there. These beings are abducting people removing their consciousness just like my consciousness was removed from my body i believe they're removing consciousness from abductees and that's the power source that they're using it's like these are the v8 engines they're putting in these uh you know cars uh, of course they're going to feel benevolent because they got the consciousness of a or mrs jensen doesn't even realize that oh you know when she goes to sleep at night her consciousness is powering a clone to do to do god knows what while the experiences are alarming the effort to wipe or hide the memory is just as disturbing. But through regression therapy, most abductees uncover the truth. Whatever kind of ET you're with, they'll lean over and look at you right in the face. They would look at me with their eyes and they would telepathically speak to me and they would tell me, you will not remember this. You will not remember this. And they would switch from looking at me to looking down at my lower body and I would feel a cold scalpel slice with no pain. And they would look back at me with their eyes and I would directly have to look in their eyes. And they would, they would tell me to look in their eyes and focus. They were calm messages, calm voices. I remember those eyes, those eyes that you, you just can't forget. It was like glass and it was cold cold, empty stare, literally like a robot, like AI. You will be just fine. You will be just fine. And, and the word baby conception, of course, I remember hearing that. Not only did I write it down, I heard it telepathically. Even when they're showing you these things, they're controlling your thoughts. They're controlling your, what you're seeing in your mind. And, they're, and, it, and I don't like that. I think I get the feeling that they just want me to just go with it and go, oh, okay, okay. But I fight it and it's hard to describe, but you can feel that they're frustrated with you. This program is a part of the reptilian program, a much darker program, darker from our concept of, you know, negative. And um, th what they are inserting in you is a much lower vibration entity. And the reason why they create these screen images and they go through all this trouble of doing this is because what happens with sexual energy is when a union is created, the amount of energy that is created from that union is an energetic signature that is ingrained into the hybrid being. From the moment of conception or contact, literally, that unification of that energy is imprinted within the subconscious mind and the vibration of the being and that's going to designate the vibration and the subconscious mind of this whoever they're creating throughout their entire life that's when you start to understand the power of sex and the difference between something done through love and something done through some painful situation that's why they go through the trouble of creating this screen image of a man, whatever. What he looks like, doesn't look like, it doesn't matter. They just pull out from your subconscious mind what may seem they think is going to be appealing to you. Sorry guys, not all DTs are good, you know? Just like here on Earth, we have bad people, we have good people, it's the same thing. It's just everything is a fractal of the whole. You know, you get smaller and smaller down, it's the same thing as the big thing, so you have good people you have bad people people with agendas out to do you know whatever it's the same thing up there same thing i mean look human beings for ten thousand plus years have taken animals in the wild and bred them and thereby changing them we that's how we created all the species of dogs that exist from wolves cattle are totally different from where they were thousands of years ago sheep sheep in the wild are aggressive and tough well not the way we breed them we change all of these animals and so now can we be bred into something different? And the answer is absolutely, of course we can. We're doing it to ourselves now. Uh, but a real question to ask is, has someone else come, taken us, and added a different mixture? There are no fixtures in nature. 
The universe is fluid and volatile. Abduction experiences that involve sexual reproduction are harrowing enough, but the emotional and psychological challenges only intensify with what comes next. Well, we were very excited because we had one daughter, very blessed, and changed our world for happiness. We realized we want to share this happiness with a sibling. I called a friend of mine out of this women's spiritual group in Manitou Springs. I said, please come over. I need some help. Something crazy happened last night. Looks me up and down. She tilts her head and she goes, Sierra, why are you pregnant? So I told her everything. And she's like, mm-hmm, okay, yep, makes sense. And I'm like, would you please just tell me what's happening? And that's when she broke down the whole Zeta hybridization program in detail. And I just sat there shaking my head going, this is a bunch of nonsense. I'm not bisexual. I don't have a relationship with men. So it's like, how am I pregnant? When we have the reports from the witnesses that have an alternative lifestyle, such as lesbianism, that have never had sexual relations with the man who, are, who is now pregnant, what do you do with that? We formed a plan. I said I wanted to keep the baby. It was nobody's right to impregnate me and use me as a laboratory rat. I wanted to keep the baby. They had me move out of my girlfriend's house and I would go and stay with each one of these women. And then they would tell me when I would move. So it was like this whole cloak and dagger thing that we did. Knowing that I was pregnant four months, I could have been pregnant a little bit longer before then. I was starting to show. All well, the women were telling me what to do, taking care of me. And my girlfriend and I started having a lot of riff. I really think, even though she's such a believer, when confronted with it, I think ultimately she thought I slept with a guy and got pregnant. Last, like, big argument that we had, she's like, Sierra, this is a real baby. You need to go to a doctor. I've always been very careful with my partners, and we've always been very conscious about having the right time to start a family. The times that I would become pregnant was very... We, we couldn't understand how that could have happened. Okay, number one. Number two, um, it would always end in a miscarriage. Yeah, I could conceive, but I never kept it. Um, I would have indications of pregnancy, heightened sense of smell, um, sensitivity, things like that, and then I would have a slightly heavy period and gone. I don't even think I knew that I was pregnant on a few occasions until I had a very late period. I went and checked and, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. And then I had a miscarriage. It's like, oh, okay. It was an emotional roller coaster because sometimes I would get excited and I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, we didn't expect it. Well, you know, let's just make the best of it and we'll just, you know, make it work. Some months I would miss the cycle and then three months would pass and I wouldn't have my cycle. And then I would think that I was, you know, pregnant, but there was no way, like I didn't have a partner or anything. One month, all the way up to three months, and we let my body clear out and try again in two more months. And it began to be feeling like it was gonna be another letdown. Why are we trying again? Very emotional. When I started to have the miscarriages in November, I went to UCLA because I didn't want to. I would have a miscarriage, just like a normal miscarriage. Then other times I would go in for my appointment and there would just be no baby. It would just be, you must have absorbed, the doctor would say, your body must have absorbed it. Medical doctors, medical science would say the same thing, like you had a miscarriage and your body absorbed that, um, that, that child, that being. I don't feel comfortable arguing with medical doctors about this. All right, they know a lot more about this than I will know. But I have spoken with women who have had such a situation happen. And what's interesting about some of them is that they have also had what any normal person would say, that's a UFO experience, that's an alien abduction experience. In other words, some of these people, in addition to having a missing fetus, have also had uh, memories, clear memories of, of abductions by non-human beings. After my first menstrual cycle, that's when they started to 
uh, pick me up and uh, do more things for, with me as far as reproduction. I had two children already, you know, my son and my daughter, and I didn't want to have more. So I went to the doctor. I thought I wanted to get a tubal ligation. We made the appointment. I went in to get it done, and they did it in the office under local anesthesia. But while he was in there doing the tubal, he said, you know, your abdominal cavity is full of adhesions. Have you had any other procedures? You know, every time I would go to the doctor, he would be like, mm, you're fine, you're fine, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong. And then they found cysts, little cysts. That seems to be very common with women that do this. They've had sonograms and, you know, pregnancy tests that show this. Clearly, they're pregnant, and then they report literally overnight they're not. They knew something was different. They knew something was wrong. They go to the doctor, and there's not a sign they were ever even pregnant. It was probably about a week, week and a half later. I just, I sat straight up in bed, and I screamed. And my stomach was flat, and I was like, it's gone. The baby's not there anymore. When a woman is pregnant, many times that the alien beings will abduct her and manipulate the, the fetus in utero. I would say six, about 16 of those are done with, through, through like in my, in my uterus, like actually insemination. Can that happen? Well, we know, we do in vitro fertilization. We do, you know, uh, we have surrogates who, who can carry a baby to term for others. Okay, we have that kind of monkeying around within our genetic uh, code now. We know it can be done. There have been very few doctors that I've talked to who have been willing to do much in the way of examination in, in these manners. And it is difficult because it costs money, of course, equipment and, and labs and all of that is, is expensive. They did an ultrasound and what the lab tech said, and understand this was kind of said under his breath, and I, he said, well, that's interesting. It's something I've never seen before. And I said, what's that? And he said, a perfectly intact egg sac without an egg. I was told that I had endometriosis, which I just attributed, you know, the miscarriages to that. But again, I was young. I just took the word of the doctor and didn't question it too much, to be honest with you. I couldn't connect the dots. And my doctors I went to, you know, a lot of them would be like, you know, just take it easy. It's supposed to be a relaxing period. You need to go ahead and learn to have a stress-free weekend, you know? A lot of it was trying to be associated with stress, but I wouldn't, I didn't feel stressed out. They always want to do testing on your hormones. Are you sleeping okay? His stress level, what's going on in his world? Is your career very demanding? Uh, a lot of factors. After probably the fifth miscarriage, we began to get a little bit antsy and um, emotional about it. It was taking a toll on me, my body. It's painful. It's very painful. And they are not gentle, obviously, because, you know, they don't, they don't think what they're doing is wrong. They, don't, they also don't have the same scale of emotions and sentiments that we have. It's very different. There's a number of these cases. I personally believe, this is one reason I believe that there's a hybridization program, because of this fact this factor. My personal experience, I would put it in the hundreds of you know, reports that I'm either aware of or have been personally involved in. These are more common than most people realize. And when you have a number of these witnesses remembering this, then I'm absolutely, I pay attention to that. I think that this is something that's going on. This is so difficult for, you know, not only the, the uh, female abductee, but in, if they're in a relationship where a woman like April will have several miscarriages and then she'll finally be able to get pregnant. I had thought I got the flu. And at that time, I did not know that we had became pregnant. That night was more of a, an awe moment of, this is the reason why you woke up with the blood on your stomach. This is the reason why you woke up writing down baby conceived. Uh, it was a moment of clarity of this being helped you create something to come. We've noticed that most of the uh, abductees are in a certain age group. 
everyone that I know of, their children are gifted children. They're all very bright kids for some reason. I don't know why. But the best way to change a civilization is to start with the children. And April truly believes she was a beneficiary of alien intervention. It did yield my son. Absolutely. Without any doubt. It's unexplainable, but probably six weeks after that dream that was confirmed it was a pregnancy, and we had we didn't want to say too much. We didn't want to get our hopes up. That was the biggest thing, not getting your hopes up. But did it bother us that we both knew that we had had an encounter with something that was not of human race that helped us genetically have a baby? We were so excited. It didn't, it didn't phase us. The pregnancy itself was very, very different, not only for me carrying him as a mother, but even for the doctors, the blood work was very different. It evolved all through the nine months and we were both okay. Unlike April, most experiencers involved in hybrid programs don't have earthbound children, yet they remain connected some of them have talked repeatedly, actually. There have been a number of cases of women claiming to remember being taken aboard a craft and being presented with an infant that they were told was theirs. Some people have many hybrid children. Just last night, I regressed a man who had discovered he had 336 hybrid children. The number 17 sticks in my mind, which is a lot. But I think that uh, not many of them grew up. I think most of them died in infancy. I have 24 hybrid children, and it's a lengthy process. Okay, the hybrid, the, the whole process of insemination, of having the children, and many other implants that happened in between in order to facilitate the program. Sometimes they're taken when the hybrid children are more in their childhood years or even older. And as I'm brought back into ship, he shows me again another box. The box has eight little lights, eight little lights. They zoom up in front of me, all around me, and then they expand. And the first thing I see is this little boy, strange blonde curly hair, these magnificent giant eyes, eyes that, that we don't have on this planet, complex eyes, deep eyes and uh, very frail, thin skin, uh, thin structure to the body, beautiful. And as I'm looking at this child, it's this feeling of love that comes over me. And I, I understand, I see myself in, in the child with these be this beautiful eyes, this face and everything. As this child comes closer to me, it's this immediate knowing that that is my, as a product of myself because I can see myself in the child. And I am overcome with this feeling of motherhood. One night I went to bed and I woke up in a cave. I can feel the cold, damp feeling on my feet. It's lit up with light that I can't see the source of the light. And there's a gray there with a little girl. And she didn't look right. She was pale and she had, her hair was stringy and kind of a dirty blonde color. She has a nose, but it's small. She had huge blue eyes and and I can't take my eyes off of her face because I'm, I'm trying to see me in her and I don't. And he brought her to me and he said that she's yours. Which threw me because I can't, I can barely accept this. This sounds insane, I realize, but I was shocked. I didn't question whether he was telling me the truth or not, which is, I find strange now, but I knew he was telling me the truth. And he, he, he walked her up to me and told me to mother her. And I took it to mean show her affection. She never once opened her mouth. She never spoke verbally. 
I could tell something was wrong. And um, I don't know, I don't know whether it's just, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was, she was sick. I don't know if she just needed to learn about affection. I don't know, I don't know what it was, but something wasn't right. Like she was emanating her feelings about me very strongly. Don't come near me. I don't want anything to do with you. But I also noticed she was obedient to the gray. She never showed any expression on her face. She stared at me and just telepathically let me know, I don't want anything to do with you. And so since it wasn't going the way that the gray wanted it to go, I was taken back home. And I've never seen her since. And I don't know if, do they lie? You know, is it a lie? Is it possible that that, that wasn't mine? And, you know, I don't know. And if so, why, why would God allow that? It's just hard, you know, because you don't know what happened. And then they explained to me, we've done this before, we're gonna do this again. And I go, what do you mean they've done this before? And then they bring this little girl in the room. She looked to me to be roughly four or five years old. She had very thin blonde hair, like part in the middle, long to about shoulder length, kind of scraggly, very thin blonde hair. And because I just, I, I looked right at her, just like I'm looking at you. And then I went like, I don't want to look like I'm staring. And they immediately took her out of the room and they took her past me out because I'm in, just inside the doorway. They took her past me out the door. I kind of stepped back into the hallway. They take her down the hallway and I go, uh, uh, and I was like frozen. I mean, not, they didn't do anything to me. I was just in shock. And I wanted to say, wait, bring her back. Well, ever since then, I had extreme guilt that I'd turned away from my own child. A few decades later, Melinda had a chance to redeem herself. Walking in, like as if there was a hallway or something out there, in this door are these grays, and then with them is this adult hybrid. And they have her stand there. And I looked at her, and I'm like, whoa. Now, bizarre looking, but beautiful. Very thin blonde hair, big forehead, little chin, would not pass for human, but yet human enough. And I remember thinking, is this her? And then the grays right next to me went to like introduce her, like, th like this is, you know, kind of a thing. And they were like, oh, whether it was a look on my face or, you know, it's all telepathy with them anyways, they were like, oh, you know who this is? I said out loud to her, I'm sorry. I said, I love you. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't think this would be happening. Sorry. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> just, sorry, just emotion. Sorry. I just, I said to her, I mean, I had this moment to apologize from all those years, from 25 years of, 24 years of saying I had turned away. A new statement is always hated by the old, and to those dwelling in the old, comes like an abyss of skepticism. Common things that you see when you're listening to some of these stories is the sincerity and the love that they had already that is now um, taken, there, there's a loss. Sometimes the people who claim that they've carried a baby to term and then the baby disappeared seem to be people with emotional problems at times. But if that really happened, wouldn't someone be experiencing emotional problems? That shouldn't disqualify us from looking into these sort of things, especially if there is any physical evidence. Certainly if you're talking about something that has seemed taboo or fringe, then they're, they're unfortunately not gonna is forthcoming to help people. First is you've had the experience. Am I losing my mind? What is going on? Could this really be happening? What happened to me? Getting over the fear to allow yourself to remember and the trauma of the loneliness, the separation, the feeling like you can't talk to anyone. I mean, you're like traumatized twice. Emotionally, physically, and to just make sense of it all. Because at this point, my life is, is utter chaos. I was petrified, 
petrified in fear. I, I could, I tried to scream. I tried to like yell out for my husband. I don't know how long I've sat there frozen, because it, it, it looked at me, and then it, it leaned back, and and I was scared. It was right behind that wall, and I had to go walk right past it to get to my bedroom where my husband was. I wasn't ashamed or embarrassed. I was just too emotionally shocked by the visions, by the clarity of the things that not only did I see, but I felt like they were happening again. Now that I know that the being was um, an aggressive being, that it was more of a rape, I couldn't even talk about it with him. I had to wait a few days to let him hear the audio because I couldn't talk about it. You want to do everything you possibly can to shove it in a box, to explain it away, to make yourself feel better that without your knowledge nor your permission, somebody has used your body and your DNA for their benefit, for their agenda. All of this is happening without their agreement, without their permission. And this is a very important aspect of the whole phenomenon. They knew that I wasn't going to remember because they were going to work me over with drugs and rape and, uh, and uh, just a lot of really uh, difficult things, you know, really terrifying things. You mentioned the word rape. That's a very powerful word. Yeah. Is that really what you felt? I, oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Being held down, and you have this non-human in your face and it had claws and it hurt and it was definitely something that was not wanted or willed for. They were each physical. They were all different. Um, sometimes in a sterile setting like OR. And then unfortunately there was times of, um, I guess you would say, it was more of a um, very public, uh, I would call it a rape again, where there was humans. I could see human faces along with different species of aliens or others. I was all in a big circle and watching very silently. There was different settings, um, different times. I've since really delved into that uh, to try to figure out why did they have people watching. I think it was to increase the level of trauma for me. And, uh, and I think some of the people there watching didn't want to be there watching, but they may have been scientists working on things and they may have been forced to watch that to know what would happen to their wives or their daughters if they ever talked about what they were working on. The weird thing is I couldn't close my eyes. It was having to physically have your eyes open, see this being, um, feel it, hear it, smell it. Very, very real. Unfortunately, part of this process also left me with fear. Fear of rejection, fear of ridicule, um, fear of judgment. But through the process, it was my own judgment that caused probably the most chaos in my life. But the initial reaction is often one of trauma because you're dealing with the unknown. You can be afraid of it. You can be uncertain and have self-doubt. And, and, and you might realize you're having post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD, it's all the same symptoms. When we all suffer a trauma, we suffer the same symptoms, but, and, and UFO abduction is no different. It's, it's trauma. And then you have to deal with like trauma all over again because then comes the fear of what is anyone else gonna say? Do I tell my spouse, my partner? Do I tell my parents? Do I, you know, and what are they gonna say? And heaven forbid that person be negative towards you. You're traumatized all over again. And a sense of growing isolation only intensifies the trauma for experiencers. 
I know this is hard to articulate, but how do you describe what it's like to be someone who's had tremendous, extraordinary experiences that no one believes? When you're in a crowd of people and you just um, stand there, and it's like, it's like you're not moving, but everybody else is. And the, and the camera's kind of just spinning around them, so you get this dizzy spinning feeling. That's like that. It's like that. It's like I'm standing still and the world's moving around me. I felt it was important for me to, to tell as many people as I possibly could. The interesting thing was, is I witnessed this. I'm excited, I'm, I'm terrified, and I'm going through all these emotions, and I'm like telling people, hey, oh my God, I'm so excited. You're not gonna believe this, I'm getting, bullshit and I'm like bullshit dude at that moment I realized I got a problem here I got a serious problem here and that is no one's gonna believe it constantly as an abductee you wonder am I choosing to see this in a positive way because I'm forced to have to deal with it and live with it and I have to integrate it in my life and that's how I've come to terms with it or is this the way it really is and I constantly battle with that I didn't even want to research more than not just looking superficially at what happened because I was like, what's the point? Like, okay, it happens to people, maybe it happened to me. Oh, well, you know, that's fine. Let's just keep going. But it was a pain. It was internal struggle inside. It's like living two lives, being two different people. The two life split, I call it life A and life B, right? And in life A, you have uh, Rob, which now is, you know, Rob the painter. And uh, Rob the painter, he goes to work, he pays his bills, hangs out with his, with his buds, you know, he does things that people do. Life B is this, my, what I could say my true self, because I'm interacting with you guys and I'm more free and more open. Not talking about it doesn't help you integrate what, what the experience and suppressing a tremendous amount of emotion. I would feel torn and there were times when I would, you know, break down and I would cry about these things because I couldn't express myself and talk about them. There was nobody that could understand what I was going through. I realized at the moment I was going to tell him how it sounded. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna say I saw? And what am I gonna say happened? And are the kids okay? And, you know, it, it just sounded, I mean, I was just so scared and petrified and I knew it sounded crazy. I knew when I was saying it out loud to him that it didn't sound believable. But I also knew what had just happened. So it was very hard to make him understand what I had just seen. I didn't know what to do. And, and so I said, please, you have to, do you believe me? Do you believe me? And he said, I believe that you believe it. You feel alone. You feel as though there's absolutely nobody else in the world that can understand. And, and you try and explain it, and you realize you don't have the language to explain. You don't even know what's going on. How can somebody else commiserate with you? They can't. And then there's the aspect of now they're worried about me. Now they see me struggling. Now they're worried about my mental capacities. They're worried about my emotional uh, stability. And they should be, because I'm emotionally all over the place. I'm mentally all over the place. I'm not okay, but I'm good. It's become an intimate part of my life. You know, I'm fully integrated into this now. It, does that mean technically I don't exist to other people, you know, because I kind of exist outside of the realm of what they believe is possible. It is difficult, but so yes, not everyone needs to go public by any means, but recall your memories, get some support, meet some other people you can talk to. You're not alone. Every ultimate fact is only the first of a new series. There is no outside, no enclosing wall. Once you start to remember some experiences, once you, you explore. So if you, if you think you've had experiences, 
First is gather gather your evidence. I'm always telling people this. Gather things like, you know, draw your experiences, take photos of bruises and marks and scars, you know, scoop marks and other scars that appear overnight, um, needle marks, you know, take pictures because later you'll have those pictures. Even if you never show anyone else, it shows you that that was real. And then work with a hypnotherapist to recall memory. If you have little bits and pieces, or like you were saying, screen memories, then work with someone, get that recalled. And when you look at a number of cases that have been uh, e extracted through hypnotic regression, which, okay, that's sometimes people will come question that as a methodology, but nonetheless, there are a lot of women who will remember the embryo or fetus being taken out of them. Many of the people who've come to me wonder, why me? Why are these unusual things happening to me? I didn't ask for this. I didn't get my permission. You know, the most important thing is that I tell them is to get the information out, bring it forward, verbalize it. Whatever's in there, if it needs to come out to make this world a better place, then I guess I gotta, I gotta do the deal. I gotta, I gotta pursue it. They are so ready to know, to go through the process, because they're so tired of all the years of wondering and having the recurring dreams, having the fear of what they don't know, because suppressing it is not going to help them with the healing process. Brian is the most important person alive to me on this journey. He's my rock. Not only is it comforting, but it's acceptance. It's, we are gonna get through this together. We are gonna make it together. There was an article he read on MSN of a young man that had went to a hypnotherapist in LA that helped him to place the nightmares and to place the events that were missing or traumatizing to him. That article on MSN had really broke the ice for him. My wife needs to talk to someone about these nightmares. When someone contacts me for the first time, I in initially will send them information about hypnosis and what it entails and about support group. And that, you know, they, they must think about this uh, carefully because once the information comes forward, we can't put it back. You know, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't shove it back in. They send me their questionnaires, I review, they come in for their first session. I schedule two hours for each person. We sit and talk about what's happened to them and what where they want to start. It begins to feel different. It begins to feel more acceptable to them. And that's one reason why I think it's very worthwhile if a person is doing some work and recalling the details of being part of this hybrid program and realizing more of the complete picture. Now with April, when I received her questionnaires, red flags were going up. Okay, I thought, okay, this, this sounds like she's, she's had a tremendous amount of uh, miscarriages. When I see that from a questionnaire, I know this it's gonna be a very emotional session. I was definitely a skeptic. I did not believe that the mind would be able to remember anything from the past or any type of trauma, any type of unknown. Of course, as everybody will tell me, oh, I don't think I could be hypnotized, and I try to you know, relax them and say, everybody can. It's just a matter of you deciding to allow me to be your facilitator. In the very beginning, Yvonne and I privately, just me and her talked in the very beginning of what was going on in my life at that time. She kind of got to know me. Before we even go into hypnosis, I tell them, you know, you know you, you're gonna relive what happened, but I want you to just tell me what's going on and I will use different techniques that you don't have to experience the pain or the, you know, or the fear, but you can always tell me, I want to stop. And I'll always ask you, do you want to go on? And then she walked me through April, we want you to lay down, I want you to relax. Pick a happy thought, a happy place, a relaxing place. 
and she walked me through the steps. Her voice was very tranquil. It was very relaxing. Before I knew it, I was talking with my eyes shut and I felt so heavy. I felt like there was a warm blanket around me. I felt secure. And she just slowly started taking me to my happy place, walking me down these steps. You're counting backwards, 15, 14. And then we started talking about the things I would see, the things I would hear. And the more and more she spoke to me, the more and more my mind began activating the nightmares. I would hear and see and even smell some of the things that I had previously had night terrors about. After the session was over, um, April was, of course, in total disbelief that she had experienced what she did in hypnosis. They're going to remember more because whatever information is important to them, they're going to remember more. Regression therapy has become popular within the UFO experiencer world because it helps abductees better understand what may have happened. Connecting with others who have had similar experiences is critically important, too. It is a community of people, you know, that we, everyone knows each other, kind of, sort of. But the thing that's important here is that when you talk about a particular group of people that are watching a particular movie and it makes them feel like they can now come clean with something that they've been bothered by, that is the dialogue that we want. But you've got to understand, and you do, that along with that comes the other people that see an opportunity to get and become important. And they do it to become important. They do it to make money. They do it for all these other reasons. They do it for all the human reasons. And that's something that, again, signal and noise. The signal is the gem. The noise is the stuff we want to get out. Hearing other people's accounts will make you go, OK, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. And those other people can be extremely supportive, especially if they're an abductee that's lived with it for a while. They've gone through all those emotional highs and lows and those moments of doubt and confusion and, and all those things that can help you. The very first time I went to a support group, the idea that I wasn't alone and I wasn't crazy was incredible and that we were there supporting each other because something happened. And we all believe that in some way we were contacted or abducted. The next step of me accepting that it was real was speaking to the people that were near me when it happened and having them validate, yep, that happened. It's the most important thing ever. It's the most important thing ever. You have to search out others, you have to. And you ha if you're going through something, reach out. Dana wasn't alone in her experiences. More than 20 years later, members of her community still get together to discuss what happened. Support group meets once a month, and um, there's probably 30 people that come and go. You know, not everybody comes to every single meeting. But in a, there's a lot of people who don't come to the support group that have had experiences that, that I've spoken with, and that number could be as large as 60. The most important thing is to talk about it and express yourself. And the more that we talk about it, you're doing two things. Energetically, you're raising the vibration in the collective consciousness because now whoever's listening to you is opening, is planting a seed of new information. Secondly, you're helping yourself energetically because now you're no longer containing that energy. Any kind of emotion, feelings, thoughts that is suppressed causes illness and stagnation of energy. Get it out one way or another, whether it's to your neighbor or your friend, doesn't matter. The more we talk about this with whoever we talk about it, it's like we're planting the seed in like a domino effect. More people will at least have heard it once in their lifetime. And that's all we need sometimes. And that knowledge, that support that I got from this contact group is probably the greatest gift. And so I can say today, yes, I am a lonely one but I'm not the only one. It's anyone's guess at how big this phenomena really is, considering all the other investigators that probably have had as many phone calls and interactions as I have. Now, having been in this field for a long time and covered the stories, helped run conferences and stuff like this, I mean, I help run the UFO Congress, and we have, uh, at the Congress alone, you know, a huge percentage of the people that come to that conference come to 
these, uh, these experiencer meetings where people come and share their experiences. In fact, it, it makes up a large percentage of the people. And if there are thousands of people sharing that they, they have these sort of experiences uh, and talk to others, you know, there's probably a number who, who believe that and, and aren't sharing it with people. So the numbers I think are staggering. That's why, you know, it deserves attention. The patterns in the data are significant and they have to be appreciated. It doesn't mean that it's absolute fact and then we go on to some ideology about interpreting it and we get all hell bent on going back in our boxes based on our own interpretation. I think it's fair to appreciate the patterns in the data and let the patterns speak for themselves and let the human responses be mature and evolved and responsible individually and collectively. And what else can we ask for? The wider your audience, the more noise you're gonna get. But you're gonna get more signal too. And that signal being louder, you know, maybe there'll be some qualifications or some characteristics of that signal that'll make it more obvious to discern from the noise. And guess what? You only need one. You only need one good solid signal. That's it. Question and answer, we can all go home, you know? Right, but until then, we have to just keep doing what we do, and we have to keep trying to wade through all the data. It's more than mountains, it's, it's planetoids worth of data. But the one thing we have is consciousness. Like, that's our secret weapon, is this ability to break those boundaries, to break the matrix. We can all do that. That's actually something every single person can do, is break those chains, those mental chains. The life of man is a self-evolving circle, from a ring imperceptibly small outwards to new and larger circles without end. The elk being tagged by us don't get a choice. And they're not being, you know, they get shot with tranquilizer darts. They're going, what's happening? And then bam, they put this tag in their ear. Well, you know, we're not giving them a choice. And the aliens aren't giving many of us a choice, perhaps, if they're doing that. That's, as we say, we're going to pretend that's actually happening. It may very well be. So that tells me that they don't consider us any kind of elevated being. It means that we are not considered beings worth telling them this to, telling that they're being abducted. It means that they don't, these beings that are doing the abducting don't have the same morality as we do. We have got to remember that we're dealing with probably the most significant event that human beings could ever imagine. This, the arrival, the presence of others who are so far advanced and they're here and they're dealing with us and they've got their own agenda and the only way that we're really going to be able to make sense of it is by working together, by sharing information and learning and gaining strength from each other and giving strength to each other as well. More and more people are coming uh, who've had the extraterrestrial encounters, but who are wondering what their special mission is. And usually I'm finding out they're already doing quite a bit of that mission. It's easy to say that I'm suppressed. I can't do this because they won't let me. It's easier to say that than to do the hard work to make it happen. And the people who do the hard work to make these things happen are making these things happen. And that's what it takes. The abductees that go public are risking that ridicule. They're risking not only the person watching this John Q. Public going, I don't believe it, it's hogwash, it's nonsense, it's no, or the science community, you know. They're risking their own family. I know, I know a medical doctor who lost his license over this subject. Lost his being a medical, he was an amazing medical doctor, worked with kids, lost his license. I know an abductee who not, I know multiple abductees who've been divorced over this subject. And I know one whose children wanted, when she went public, her children disowned her. No, it's, it, it, sorry, I'm getting all emotional here. 
But it's, it, it, I tell you, man, it's, there's no reason to go public about this other than to help other people that have had it happen and try to convince a public that doesn't want to hear it that this is real. But you guys, this may have everything to do with the future of the human race and where we're going. Educate yourself, be open-minded, read, go to a UFO conference, see the researchers, present the good evidence, make up your own mind. Don't let anyone ever tell you how to think. Make up your own mind about everything in life. But if you've got thousands of people that say this is an ongoing process, they've been subject to it. At what point do you say they're all lying or they're all telling the truth or some of them are lying and some of them are telling the truth? I mean, where, where do you draw that line? Well, unless it's happened to you, it's just a story. If you experience, it changes you to the core. And that's the point, I think. Keep an open mind because, you know, Something you hear today may sound totally incredible, but then you hear it again and again and again from people who don't even know each other. And if you keep an open mind, you'll grow with it. Whether, you, whether you're sold on it or not, you'll see an evolutional process here. Know that these people have been through a lot. Have compassion. How would you treat someone who's been raped in a plane crash? a cancer survivor or someone with a life-threatening illness or, or a deformed child? How would you treat them? What kind of compassion would you show them? Show that to the people who've had this experience. Even if you don't understand it, even if you don't believe it's real, know that that person's going through something emotionally real for them. You don't have to understand it. You just have to be kind. God, isn't that the truth of everything? Being kind and compassionate to everyone? It's a ride I don't suggest people take. I don't suggest it because it's ruined my life. You lose your career, your wife, your house, your, your money, your dog, you know. How, how much of this is acceptable when you've done nothing wrong? You're an experiencer and you didn't ask for this, or you're a researcher and you're bravely looking into this. You know, people will ruin other people's lives because they can't accept it. All you do is you be there. You have a big enough heart, you know, a big enough understanding. You rise to the occasion and you say, I'm there for you. And that's all we ask. Unless you've had these experiences, they are hard to comprehend. But pain is pain. The struggle to understand something so extraordinary is a lonely journey. Sometimes we just need someone to be there for us, to listen. Unfortunately, my wife, you know, couldn't, couldn't do this with me. Uh, but Megan, she's, she's been with me like, like, uh, like through and through, you know. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's where it gets hard, right there. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, without her, without her, there's no way. There's no, there's no fucking way. I could have done. I could have done it. You, you just don't understand the, the the hell we went through together. The absolute torture. If we just hold on to each other as tight as we can, because in the end we're all we got. And she's gone through so much herself. But she's been by my side the whole time. Nobody gets to see it because I'm the one that takes the takes the rings. But you know, without her, there it wouldn't be possible. I wouldn't be alive today because I wouldn't survive that transformation. Nobody could. Nobody can understand what it's like to have to go through something like I was just a person, man. I was just a fucking person. And now, now I'm, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? I don't know. But if it wasn't for her, I couldn't have survived. No way. Anybody else, they would have left me. You know, anybody else. It would have been game over because, you know, the shit I put her through, you know? <laughs> Because I'm dying, you know, and I'm, she's watching me die, and, 
You can't even imagine what that's like for a wife to see her husband dying for an unknown reason, you know, from ETs, you know, who knows, so. What was this, because we didn't ever circle back around, what was the switch that flipped you back into health? Oh, yeah, so the health thing, <laughs> it just went away. It went away, boom. I was gonna die, like, I'm going to die, I'm dying, boom, it's gone. Sometimes, um, I, sometimes I get upset because I feel like they robbed that from me. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if I should blame them for that or just life circumstances. I don't know. You know, one thing with abductees, it's very hard for abductees in relationships afterwards. That's one thing that gets really screwed up. First off, will the other person understand this and that? And you want to keep it from people. And uh, and then it affects emotional uh, intimacy. And a lot of abductees have issues with that. And part of me goes, well, no, that's just life. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then sometimes I go, no, this ex these experiences of have, an, have had an effect there. And I know that for a lot. If an abductee's watching this, I know that that's real common for a lot of them. If you're already in a relationship, it can screw it up. And a lot of abductees end up having a real hard time with intimacy and relationships. There's so many times where you push down things about this. You know, you, you like, you know, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm strong. I'm stronger in this. You know, and then at times like this, you know, because <laughs> I, so I, these are parts I don't talk about. These are what you go in support groups to talk about. That's where that realizing, oh my God, I'm not the only one. You know, I'm not the only one who has those problems. I'm not the only one with those difficulties. I'm not the only one who has, you know, intimacy things. It's, you know, and that's where that really helps. And it's necessary for more women to step outside of that fear or, and if not, if it's not the fear, there's the other duality of, oh, it's okay, it's beautiful, and ask the questions. Why are we okay with just the simple answers that we're getting? You know, people need to investigate and learn and find the highest level of truth within themselves. And each person may have another story and hopefully another puzzle piece to this to help us put together even greater understanding of this reality which is necessary. And if we as humans are within a hybridization program here on this planet, what are we doing? Who are we serving? We need to ask those questions, which brings us to the lifelong existential question, why am I here? And as you can see, that's the same question that we've been asking even now with the hybridization program. Don't be dismissive of the unknown. Be explorative of it. Or even that thought in the back of your head that you should listen to sometimes. Or that feeling in your gut. You gotta get in tune with it. Don't always dismiss yourself or dismiss it as imagination. That intuitive feeling is given to us for a reason I feel like. It's not like I'm special. This is the story for every human being. It's just I remembered a fragment of that. And it's only because I opened my heart. That's it. Just opened my mind and my heart. That's how I've grown. It's just, it's made me, I feel it's made me a better person and it, it's just made me more aware of the nature of our of our reality it's the part of ourselves in our own subconscious that fears it's the part of ourselves in our own subconscious that hates and, and is angry and in that way those parts of ourselves are complicit with the sinister forces in this world that try to keep humanity as a controlled human herd is this what we want to become more of? It's a question that every human heart is going to have to ask itself. Do they want more power and control and restriction and limitation of everything about who we are as a species? Or do we want to become what we're intended to become? Do we want to fulfill the potential that is within every codon in our DNA and see where that can take us? Can I, is it appropriate if I just speak to the camera? I, I want. I want to do this. So if you're listening and you're someone who has had 
unexplainable experiences and you don't know how to process them, or if you're just curious about this whole crazy subject of UFOs and everything related to it, I, I want to tell you, A, your ability to process this is, is actually greater than you think. There's more strength inside you than you realize. That's one. I've seen this countless times. Reach down, you can pull up that courage, and you can face that reality and you become a better person. You do. And you can become an inspiration to other people in turn. That's what you can do. The other thing to keep in mind is you're not alone. There are many other people just like you who have had difficult, unexplainable experiences, but yet there they are. And so this is a very important, significant process going on, and you can deal with it. There's other people.